So welcome everyone to uh, our inaugural virtual quantitative finance seminar series here at the Fields Institute. I know it's a, it's a very unusual year for everybody and uh, we're hoping that, uh, that to continue the, the long tradition of seminars uh, in quantitative finance that was started back in the fields uh, many, uh, several decades ago. Uh, today, it's a, it's a great pleasure to have um, Alex Lipton with us today. Uh, he's the co-founder and chief information officer at Scylla and partner at uh, Numera Financial, visiting professor and dean's fellow at Hebrew University of Jerusalem. And he's also a connection science fellow at MIT, um, amongst many other uh, accolades. Uh, I'll get a couple of little highlights uh, for about uh, Alex before letting him take the, uh, the reign. So in 2016, he left the Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, where he was there for, for, for a decade uh, in senior roles, including quantitative solutions executive and co-head of the global quant group there. His pr current professional interests include FinTech, particularly in applications of distributed ledger technology to payments and banking, digital currencies, including stable coins and asset-backed asset -back cryptocurrencies, robust asset allocation, automated investing, and a host of other things. And you probably all know Alex very well from uh, his books that, that he's published over the years. Uh, he was also the Quant of the Year Award winner back in uh, 2000. And he's currently finishing his next book with uh, Adrian uh, Tricani on blockchain and distributed ledgers, mathematics, technology, and economics. And I guess it's going to be out next year, right? In near the beginning. Yes. Very true. Well, with that, uh, Alex, uh, I'd like to like you to take the floor and thank you very much for coming in to speak to us on stable coins and decentralized finance news from the cryptocurrency universe. Oh, thank yourself. you. Thank you, Sebastian, for your very kind introduction. And it's a great pleasure to speak again at the, the Fields Institute, which I cherish very much and have many friends and colleagues and co-authors um, at the institution. And so it's a little unusual, of course, to speak uh, remotely. And, uh, you know, but I hope it will at some point go back uh, to the conventional face-to-face -face, and then maybe I will be giving a privilege to speak again in person. But how are we so doing? Alex, what, one, one small thing I forgot to mention yes. uh, in terms of admin, like logistics, please, please post do. your questions in the chat and, uh, and then we'll, we'll call upon you towards the end of the talk to, uh, to ask them in person, okay? Brilliant. Thanks. Thank yeah. you very much. So anyway, the subject of the presentation are stable coins and decentralized finance, as Sebastian already mentioned. And, uh, um, you know, the idea is to connect the most recent developments in the um, area of uh, crypt, uh, blockchains and cryptocurrencies with uh, very old concepts which have been around for quite some time and see how things are developing in perspective, right? So going back a long time, 2000 years or so, uh, we can go to Aristotle who noticed that money has been introduced by convention as a substitute for need or demand and as such uh, it exists in the confines of law. And so he was explaining the uh, name namisma for money in Greek uh, from the name law, uh, from, from the, 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 the word law, nomos, right? So that is uh, very true, I suppose, and that is a little bit of an issue with uh, the existing cryptocurrencies that, in a sense, they occurred uh, out of nowhere on their own volition, and now there is a little bit of a tug of war between the libertarians who think this is the best thing um, after sliced bread, and it might very well be the case, and people who would like to put it more in the um, you know, confines of the existing system, right? So the, whoever is gonna win uh, is gonna dominate uh, the world for the next uh, d few decades. So it's an interesting competition, right? So the other thing which is also very important to understand that, uh, you know, kind of money among very other, many other 
attributes, you know, like um, has an information quality, right? So this uh, Nicolas Erasm, um, you know, mo monetary theoretician from the Middle Ages from France, I identified the stamp, the value of the stamp or image on the coin as a kind of a, a incredibly important informational concept, right? So that is also important kind of when we start to discuss stable coins and the likes, right? And then the third observation, again, from the late Middle Ages is from Nicholas Copernicus, who was uh, in his spare time actually a consultant and sort of making a little money on the side by advising the Prussian government on the coinage. And I'm not going to go into rather intricate situation on the ground in the 15th century, but uh, he articulated several sound principles for um, producing money, and of which the third one is super important because we will see that even in modern days uh, debate about Libra and its validity and utility and so on and so forth, this third postulate of Copernicus is routinely misunderstood or forgotten altogether. And so the postulate of course says that when the new currency is issued, the old currency must be demonetized and withdrawn from circulation. And that's something which I'm gonna return to in a due course, but uh, the rest of it is probably more relevant for the time and day uh, for the time and place where he was kind of operating in the 15th century right so as sebastian already very kindly mentioned in a, this uh, presentation cover some of the material from the book which Adrian Tricani and I am finishing and hope <laughs> to finish within the next week or so or two weeks and so it will appear in the beginning of next year and then you know the book which already appeared recently is Sandy Pantland, Thomas Harjohn and myself and it's available for download freely from MIT Press and it's sort of also articulates some of our views on this um, right so the functions of money are manifold and it's hard to sort of decide uh, which one are more important but of course you know there are several which are understood universally uh, such as the money is a medium of exchange means of payments of taxes as we have seen <laughs> not everybody is paying their fair share so to speak right so money is means of payment in general store of value unit of account and this is something which i added to this esteemed list, list on my own and I very much like it, but you are free to accept or deny this. So money is a perpetual call option for acquiring goods and services and discharging and discharging one's obligations, right? So this is very important. So money is always unstable. So we will be talking about stable coins galore, but the truth of the matter is that money by its very nature is unstable. It had been unstable when it was represented by a, a talking of value like the silver denarius in Rome, and it is unstable when it is represented by fiat, by the US dollar. And by the way, this graph below, of course, is more relevant than the graph above, even though they look surprisingly similar, right? So the only thing is that it's like 100 years for the dollar and 250 for the denarius. The point which I want to make is that even those periods when dollar was ostensibly backed by gold, its purchasing power was declining uh, you know, quite steadily, right? Except for a period of time during the Great Depression when money sort of, when prices were consistently going down because of the lack of demand, right? But this is something to be aware of when you try to devise a stable coin. And we'll see that there are several approaches to taking on this problem, right? So money is inherently mathematical in nature, and I'm not gonna kind of dwell on it very much, but here is an example. Here is a 100 uh, Deutsche Mark uh, note uh, from, in, right now it's no longer a legal tender, so we can look at it more carefully. It has a number AD 5203416U6. So as it seems like a, you know, arbitrary, kind of collection of uh, uh, numbers and characters, but reality is uh, a little more interesting. So in reality, there is a mapping first uh, from uh, letters to numbers, and there are only nine letters in total, so being used, right? So they're in the table above, and so mapped to the letters, uh, I'm sorry, to the digits below. Then there is a transposition, so digits from zero to nine are being uh, transposed according to this rule here, and then there is a kind of multiplication operation, if you wish, you know, which sort of, for example, tells you how much would be 
four times three, and that is two. And so the idea is that if you start with the original number and then convert it into digits, and then start to apply this transposition as many times as the position of the kind of digit in the table. So like once, uh, you know, for, uh, for number one, uh, five times uh, for position, for the uh, digit three, uh, six times uh, for the position, uh, digit three, which is in position six and so on and so forth. And then some, according to this rule, you should end up with zero. And this is an error correcting um, mechanism, which verifies that this uh, number is indeed legitimate, right? So we will see, well, we will not see it in great detail, but this is this, the same idea is being used in Bitcoins when Bitcoins uh, addresses being formed, right? So it's very interesting. So from that perspective, there is a continuity in how things are done. Right? So there's a few observations why, you know, it's so interesting and important to look at cryptocurrency and what they can do for you. Uh, first and foremost, existing banking and payment system are still working, but they're not working very well. They're obsolete and not aligned with the changing requirements of the modern world. So, for example, in the United States, they're kind of sending checks with this, uh, you know, additional payments from the treasury. Both in many places, parts in the world, you know, the very idea of a check is not known any longer, right? So that tells you how kind of obsolete and creaky the whole situation is, at least in, in, in a number of large countries, right? So, um, you know, the other thing which is very important is that financial system, the way we know it is essentially on its last legs. You know, this, uh, the global financial crisis of 2008 uh, was not exactly a death blow but it was a very very severe blow and almost no well knockout if effectively and after that you know in spite of all the help from the from above you know this very low positive interest rates and now negative interest rates in many parts of the world are extremely uh, disadvantageous to the banking system, right? So it might look as a help to the real economy, which probably it is not, but it's certainly <laughs> a very severe bodily blow for the banking system, right? So one of the things which is slightly puzzling but important to understand is that the open internet protocols unleashed a wave of creativity and growth in many, many fields. But banking is not one of them. Of course, you can say there are kind of uh, neo banks and, you know, like uh, um, interfaces based on cell phones and stuff like that. But that's not what I mean. So there is no uh, real uh, protocol for moving money and identity, which are uh, extremely closely linked and the legal economy uh, through the internet. And that's a big problem. In fact, in the beginning, when the internet st standards were created, there were placeholders for this concept, but they were not, never filled. And I would argue that uh, regulatory compliant fiat back tokenized medium of exchange can help fill this gap. And the corresponding tokens can be viewed as an electronic version of cash and it has a pluses and it has minuses and they can have numerous fintech applications and uh, they can also be uh, used in order to um, build a decentralized financial market infrastructure of infrastructure and decentralized finance as well and that's sort of if you look why it is really needed uh you know uh it is because everything which we use right now is super complicated, right? So if you look at the settlement system in the United States, and this is just a skeleton diagram which can be increased and embellished infinitely, right? So you can see that at the heart of it is large value transfer system, and then it is connected to the Fedwire, to the retail system, and there are settlement banks which are performing a lot of important duties, uh, in particular inter intersect interacting with uh, uh, cent um, central clearing counterparties, offshore cleaning, uh, central security depositories, and so on, effect settlement, etc., etc., etc. The system is simply very complex. And this is a meta picture, right? So if we look at the microscopic picture, we will see uh, something which is really complicated. Um, uh, so, for example, if uh, we have this uh, proverbial and prototype 
possible uh, a prototypical interaction between Alice on the left and Bob on the right. And by the way, kind of um, if you look at all the cryptographic literature, if you don't use these names, you're not being taken seriously. So that's what we will be using. So Alice wants to pay with her credit card to Bob and he needs to send her some merchandise. Uh, reality of the situation that it looks like a simple transaction, but Underneath it, there are enormous uh, an amount of flows of both information and funds. And then the overall uh, settlement is happening outside of this picture through the pre previously shown uh, system of transactions, right? So that's sort of 11, 12 uh, f information and cash flows for a simple transaction. It's, sim it's, it's just too complicated, right? So uh, it becomes even more complicated if you look, for example, at the pyramid of payments, uh, cross-border payments, so, right? So if you have a US-based buyer and you're a base seller, you know, it actually has to go all the way in, in the kind of the most complicated case, it will go all the way from the uh, buyers to the buyer bank in New York, uh, you know, corresponding bank in New York, and then to Frankfurt, and then go all the way down. And what FinTech, uh, you know, uh, newcomers are trying to do is to uh, connect uh, these layers without the need of going all the way to the top of the pyramid, right? So in principle, you can use PayPal, Western Union, a credit card, et cetera, et cetera, to pay directly. But as we have seen, reality of the situation is that it will also go back to the banking system and back to the square one. So essentially, the only rails right now which can be used in order to move value or banking uh, payment system, right? So we need to build a third rail, something which is regulatory compliant, but can live outside of the existing banking system, right? So one system like that has been known for centuries, it's Havala, right? So Havala is uh, deceptively simple, and, uh, you know, it has a number of uh, problems, you know, know your customer and to money laundering and whatnot, but as a mechanism for moving money, it's basically brilliant, right? So a client comes to Cavalador, say the United States, and bring some cash, and then they, so Alice, and then Bob uh, comes to Havalador in India and receives this cash from the Havalador in India in Indian rupees. And that's that, basically. Right, so Havaladar A sends remittance call to Havaladar B, and then you know, same client A sends the same code to client B, and then the payment uh, commences. Right, so as we, uh, I, we will not have time to talk about it, but one of the more popular uh, cryptocurrencies and uh, crypto protocols, namely Ripple, is in fact uh, you know this uh, implementation of Havala in modern electronic uh, fashion. Mm -hmm. So. Um, the idea is to try and attack the sort of uh, the address the rebuilding of the financial system by using a blockchain concept, right? So blockchain is a shared distributed ledger which facilitates the process of recording transactions, right? And so in 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 in, in reality some of the things which we need to do in order to make life easy is to be able to um, record transaction permanently and uh, in un unalterably and that would really play at least some role uh, some it would be a useful step towards having a different uh, system for payments right so right now kind of the information superstructure can be organized uh, um, you know in three different way you know c c c centralized like the one in the uh, top uh, left corner uh, decentralized uh, on the right and uh, distributed on the low left corner right so uh, the idea is to move from one or better to stay two if you look at uh, trans border uh, cross border payments to three right so and to put things in a historical uh, context the um distributed ledgers are filling the gap one of those gaps uh, which are kind of fundamental for our existence right so the same way as printing press 
filled the knowledge gap in the 15th century, and the card bloom filled the programmability gap in the 19th century, and steam agents, trains, and blah, blah, blah. So in the end of the day, we have the internet, but we don't have trust on the internet. And so uh, the distributed ledgers uh, can be thought of as um, uh, trust machines, and they can fill the trust gap in the 21st century. There are several types of distributed ledgers. Some of them are unpermissioned public ledgers. These are really sort of an audacious approach to things, right? So anyone can join, anyone can transact, and all that type of thing. And this is Bitcoin, Ethereum, and many, many others right now. And then there are permissioned private ledgers like R3, IBM, and, and, and again, many others. But these are sort of more modest uh, um, Quorum, uh, there's a more modest uh, kind of out uh, um, offshoots of the original idea. So essentially, you take some of the features of the unpermission ledger but make them permission and uh, facilitate uh, consensus, which is paramount to actually uh, build something meaningful. And then, of course, we can always uh, draw back to the traditional centralized ledger. And then, as I said already, you know, it's very important to be able to uh, have consensus and the mechanisms for uh, achieving this consensus are manifold. So one is a proof of work, and that's how um, Bitcoin operates and the proof of stake. That's the dream of what uh, Ethereum has, but has not achieved yet. And it's not so easy, proof of burn and many other things. And of course, we can sort of go to more modest things like uh, practical Byzantine fault tolerance. That's how Ripple operates, for example, or Stellar. And uh, you know there are all kinds of variations. And then third party verification, that's the kind of uh, way uh, permission private ledgers operate. And the reason why it is so kind of attractive is that, uh, you know, if things were to be built properly, then all Alice needs to do in order to move value to Bob is to have something to move. That's, of course, a must. <laughs> Nobody, you know, absolves you from the necessity of acquiring money, right? So that's not like would be a bonanza. We're no, only talking about moving money around. And so she can announce that she wants to move money to Bob, to the entire ecosystem, which consists of nodes, uh, which kind of monitor transactions and miners, which uh, provide consensus in a variety of ways. And then, you know, if she has the funds and everybody is uh, ship shape in Bristol fashion, then within say 10 minutes or so, Bob nodes would be credited with value and Alice nodes would be with, you know, reduce uh, the value for her. Nodes. And that's that. So you see, compared to, for example, how I describe payments through credit cards, it's uh, decisively attractive, right? And so what is good about this picture? So anyone can participate, transactions are public, middlemen are not assigned from above, even though it doesn't mean that they do not exist because they, you know, the uh, consensus providers can be viewed as uh, middlemen to some degree, right? And so what is bad about this picture? So essentially exactly the same, anyone can participate, all transactions are public and middlemen are not assigned from the above. So since all transactions are public, there is a nuanced situation when this setup cannot be used for regulated financial institutions because they have to preserve banking privacy and things like that. And, uh, you know, just a comical um, relief for a moment. Uh, it's not like this idea of maintaining uh, you know, balance, uh, uh, like blockchain-like balance is not unknown. So for example, Rai or Fei Japanese stone money is uh, kind of a famous construct. And in fact, uh, given that I'm uh, having a privilege of speaking at, in Canada right now, you know, in Ottawa and the financial ministry, there is a huge one like that. So if you ever end up there, have a look. Essentially, these are huge stone disks uh, which were mined um, at a remote island, Palau mostly, in the Pacific, and taken by Kanoe to the uh, um, island of Yap. And then they're so huge that, of course, they cannot be moved. So unfortunately, there is no uh, sort of real scale here. But, you know, this particular stone is about two meters in diameter and probably weighs like five tons. And so the way value was assigned, they were divided mentally into pieces. 
and the uh, elders were maintaining who owns which part of the stone. And then when there were important events like uh, weddings and things like that, you know, value would change hands and that would be recorded in this oral history, right? So that's essentially how the, so the, the, the elders would be the miners and everybody else would be the nodes and everybody knew how things are. The other example, which is super exciting, but I don't have enough time to talk about it, are medieval English talistics. And uh, the, the thing which I want to mention is that they were created to sort of uh, obviate the fact that in the Middle Ages, there was not enough gold to actually have gold-based uh, payment system. And so they used wood, but it worked equally well, right? And so now, as I said, the very first uh, um, protocol used for payments was Bitcoin. And I mean, I have to say, say what you want about Bitcoin, but it is an amazing accomplishment by way of uh, creating something which continues to work without, you know, interruption for 10 years in an extremely hostile environment and which was created like that pretty much from the beginning. So like the goddess Aphrodite appeared uh, fully formed uh, from the sea uh, foam, the same way Bitcoin appeared from a certain Satoshi Nakamoto, who might be a person, might be a collective, nobody even knows that. And, uh, you know, kind of, um, and the system started to exist without asking for permission. It cannot be shut, or at least, you know, it's very hard to shut it down and it is just there, right? So the idea would be, and it came from uh, crypto punks and so on, that it would be a replacement for national currencies. It will take money away from the social and government control <coughs> from the centralized authorities, uh, full decentralization, and so on and so forth. Reality is not there, to be perfectly honest. Right? Bitcoin has very low transaction per second and very high transaction fees preventing its everyday usage. You know, there is a struggle for control by different money and other interests, and as a result, there were many hard forks. So whenever you hear that there will be only 21 million Bitcoins, that's true, but then carrying very keep in mind that there are also things like bitcoin satoshi vision bitcoin cash etc 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 the most uh, sort of uh, disappointingly from my personal perspective is that you know it it does not achieve decentralization say what you want but it is not decentralized if anything it's quite centralized right and so and also it uses a very inefficient consensus algorithm for specifically proof of work, which uh, results in enormous electricity com consumption. And yet, you know, with all these negatives and so on, it can probably be viewed as an electronic version of treasure, right? I, often it has been claimed that Bitcoin is uh, a version of uh, gold, digital gold, but that is probably not true because of a variety of ways uh, Bitcoin itself uh, self-organizes. So uh, if the number of miners drops dramatically, the system will still operate, but the difficulty of mining will be reduced a lot. Whilst if the number of gold miners drops, you know, the difficulty of getting new gold would not be declining at all. So that's an important thing. So here we can see that uh, Bitcoin is highly volatile and going from nothing essentially to $20,000 in the end of 2017 and then to 3,000. And now it's kind of hovers around. And then if we look at the Google trend, interest in Bitcoin, not surprisingly the same thing as one would expect. It grew dramatically in 2018 and since then reduced to maybe 20% of what it was. Bitcoin can be thought of as gigantic mark of chain with indeterminate number of vertices. And so consensus is achieved by a proof of work. And so it changes so the state of the mark of chain changes from one mm, stage to the next, but through uh, adding blocks of transactions. And so that's what we see here. And it's a very elegant system, I have to say. The actual uh, outputs are what is called unspent transaction outputs. So uh, Bitcoin operates on a transaction basis. If you, if you have 10 Bitcoins and want to send me one, which I would appreciate, then you 
would have to spend the entire 10 by sending me one, sending yourself 8.99 uh, and leaving uh, one hundredth of a Bitcoin or so to the miners, right? So that's how the whole system operates. And as I all mentioned already, Bitcoin does not achieve central uh, decentralization. Why? Because the very nature of capitalist production pushes Bitcoin miners into gigantic pool. It's too risky to be an individual miner because you have to spend money on hardware and electricity. The code behind mining is trivial, I have to say. And, um, but the expenditure on hardware and electricity is humongous. And so it's just too risky. And so people naturally congregate into pools. And the very fact that in the picture below in this uh, page we see individual nodes i'm sorry individual pools tells you that the whole system is highly centralized and all in all there may be like a hundred pools but in reality only like uh, 20 which matter and uh, the number of observation nodes is maybe 10,000 or so so that's the system right and then comes ethereum Ethereum is a sort of, to a large degree, Canadian invention, right? So the uh, original uh, progenitor for the system is Vitalik Buterin, who is actually known as opposite to uh, Satoshi Nakamoto. And so what Vitalik suggested is to create an Ethereum virtual machine, the first distributed Turing complete computer uh, with smart contracts, distributed autonomous organization, full decentralization, and so on and so forth. This is a truly bold idea, and also a little bit of a triumph of marketing over common sense, because the reality of the situation is that the payment structure within the Ethereum itself is such that it cannot be a Turing complete computer because it only allows so many steps per uh, cycle and that sort of thing. Smart contracts are not really particularly smart and all of that thing, etc. And of course, the decentralization has not been achieved either. Right, so and it cannot be if you use proof of work, right? So uh, it suffers from the same thing low transaction per second, very obsolete payment model for gas consumption for the making this Ethereum virtual machine to work. And smart contracts are not as smart as I said, they cannot be fixed if there are bugs, and that can result in kind of disastrous consequences, like for example, happened with the first uh, distributed autonomous organization, which was hacked to the tune of 100 million dollars or 60 million, whatever. And smart contracts are voracious consumers of collateral, centralization, etc. And yet, it is very convenient as a provider of uh, consensus as a service. So that's how I think about Ethereum. That's what I think it actually does. And again, the prices went up the same as uh, Bitcoin and the interest again, you know, went up dramatically and then went down. But that's essentially it. And so there are the difference between Bitcoin and Ethereum is that in addition to conventional nodes, which are called the externally controlled accounts, there are also nodes which do not have associated private key, secret keys, which can open them. And these are smart contracts. And so in this first transaction, uh, smart contracts are left uh, unchanged, but the number of Ethereum eaters uh, per address has changed. But in the next one, uh, there are certain messages which have been sent to smart contracts which set, change the conditions. So essentially, you can think of a smart contract as a Bitcoin and miniature. So the consensus is provided by Ethereum, but the ledger is being kept, uh, you know, like uh, any type of thing. So essentially, you can have a token operated on uh, Ethereum with consensus provided as a service. That comes very handy when you want, for example, to build stable coin or things like that. Again, there is no time, but the picture spe speaks volumes. There is a high centralization of miners. And so the advantage of Ethereum smart contracts is that they provide autonomy, trust, reliability, savings, and accuracy. So essentially the codes which are being executed and uh, these are programmable financial instruments, so maybe not necessarily financial. 
and as I said, consensus as a service, that's very, very important. However, one needs to understand that consensus is a useful service and hence it is very expensive. So for example, my startup, we use Ethereum, but it is super expensive and we're not really <laughs> super happy about it, right? And so then of course there are variations of the theme uh, which are produced by various banks and so on and so forth. The Quorum, uh, which is a permission version and other things like that, IBM Fabric, Microsoft Azure and all that, right? So, um, and then it's very interesting. I want to spend literally two minutes on something which is slightly outside of the topic of the presentation, but very interesting. So efficiency of mathematics is inexplicable, but um, staggering, sort of. In 2019, I wanted to understand the, the so-called Bitcoin dominance, which means the proportion of the overall crypto universe capitalization, which is allocated to Bitcoin. And to this end, I wanted to use the deterministic uh, version of the um, susceptible and factor removed model or a st stochastic susceptible infected susceptible model and as it turned out you know <laughs> it was prescient because you know then of course uh, uh, three or four months afterwards everybody became an expert in this because it was a popular pastime for people with mathematical inclination to model uh, COVID-19 and things like that which I part took as well but that was the sort of background which was very he healthy and the idea is that you know uh, the money moves from Bitcoin to other um, you know, cryptocurrencies like Ethereum, for example, which was exactly what it is. But then eventually people go back to Bitcoin and that sort of thing. And we're interested in the ratio, uh, which tells you how much money uh, kind of is in Bitcoin versus the entire universe. And so this is shown in the yellowish curve here, uh, the output of the model. And then in blue, you will see the, you know, the actual market observation. So it's not ideal, but it's indicative of what's going on, right? So now, as I mentioned, Ethereum can be thought through as a machine for producing new tokens and new coins. So I start with coins. Coins live outside of Ethereum. Coins, by definition, live on their own, um, on their own blockchains and there are many of them so like this is show the capitalization of the first hundred coins and the interesting thing is that they are driven by power law and this is a kind of fit of the power law which is quite good and then the tokens they live essentially on ethereum and possibly on a few other blockchains which have smart contracts and again we can see that there is a power law distribution that's pretty much the same as for <coughs> coins right and so now we can ask ourselves can we actually do something and uh, improve the financial system because using bitcoin or ethereum is not really so advantageous they're too unstable and they might have their role in the well diversified portfolio and generally sort of uh, something Mm, you know, to, to look at, uh, you know, the way I think about it is as follows. So Bitcoin has no value. It has no value, which is actually not a drawback. It's an advantage because of that, it can have any price. And so essentially Bitcoin is a gay, it's a giant casino where everybody can play and, uh, you know, kind of thing. So it can go up and down and as they do, precisely for the reason which I have meant. But if we want to build a new uh, system for payments, we need to do something else. So we can use central bank issued digital cash, for example. This is all the rage right now. In China, they already sort of, um, doing it in earnest and having a pilot project in several cities. In many other places, they also are looking into that. And, uh, you know, uh, it can open a venue for better monetary policy, or at least a policy which can be executed bolder, right? So uh, Mateusz Draseli and I have argued that with this central bank digital cash, you can have seriously negative interest rates, for example, for, for better or worse, right? And so they also can increase tax collection, uh, fighting crime and whatnot, but at the same time, they can provide um, access control over ordinary citizens. And the, the question is whether or not they should be token-based or account-based. An account base would allow every citizen to open an account with central bank, which is unlikely possibility because in addition to everything else, banks have to 
solve the uh, know your customer and anti-money laundering uh, function. And this is not what central bank can actually do. They can monitor this and regulate that, but cannot do it themselves for a very simple reason. They're very small, right, uh, personnel-wise. Right, and it's probably would be more convenient to do it through narrow banks, which I mean banks which only have, um, which only have accounts with the central bank itself. So essentially, the same way as most of the armies do not produce their own tanks and armaments, but outsource it to private companies. The same way, it's likely that central bank digital cash would be outsourced to either existing banking institutions or banking institutions which be created uh, specifically for this purpose, right? So then, of course, uh, in order to do settlement between financial institutions, one can think about utility settlement coin. This is an interesting project which has been going on for quite some time. I'm waiting to see whether or not it comes to fruition. And then, of course, we can do stable coins. Stable coins is a super interesting area and uh, they are built as tokens on top of uh, existing um, a bit, uh, existing uh, protocols, right? So it can be built on top of Ethereum, it can be built on top of Stellar, it can be built on top of Zilliqa. So the question is, uh, which system provides the best uh, uh, smart contract environment and is actually sufficiently cheap to be practical, right? So, um, you know, there are several possibilities of building um, a stable coin. One would be a fiat fully collateralized coin. And these are, there are several like this. Of course, the oldest one is Tether and nobody knows if it is indeed fully collateralized or not, but it has been around for quite some time. And among other things, Tether is remarkable because it has extreme velocity. So essentially, Tether may be like 15 billion in value and Bitcoin may be 200 billion, but in a, year, in a day, the amount of uh, Tether changing hands is actually bigger than Bitcoin. That's quite interesting. And and so one of the project is Sila Money, for which I'm part of, and sort of um, you can look at how we do it, right? So then, you know, there is no time and no need to dwell on coins partially collateralized by uh, fiat. Uh, that was an idea proposed by Saga and a few other people, but it's, it's a bad idea. So no, no time to spend on that. So crypto over collateralized coins, these are actually working coins like DAI produced by market DAO, but the overall situation with them is that they go against the grain of what the finance should be doing. Finance in principle should allow you to operate on margins. In other words, by putting a dollar, you should get maybe say $5 worth of goods, you know, to trade, of course, right? <laughs> Not as a gift, but to trade. Uh, whilst the market now goes the opposite direction. So you have to deposit $3 worth of Ethereum, for example, to get $1 worth of DAO, that sort of thing. And so there are also very nuanced situation with interest rate policies, uh, extreme um, fines if you uh, breach margin rules by way of sort of losing up to 15% of the value, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But at least, you know, it's, it's a possibility. And finally, dynamically stabilized coins with sort of coins stabilized by all algorithm, that's not a um, suitable uh, um, pro proposition, right? So, and um, now asset-backed coins, that's something which uh, my colleagues at MIT, Sandy Pentland and Thomas Harjona and myself have been working on a lot. And so the idea is to use real assets uh, to for the pool, right? For the pool, and then have uh, you know co coins representing shares in this pool. Essentially, that is something which can facilitate uh, you know fighting inflation or deflation and other things like that, and in general serve as a counterbalance uh, for the activities of central bank if such a counterbalance is needed, right? So they have uh, they can improve stability, improve trading, and so on. So you can, and then and, and we were thinking both small, like, you know, cooperatives of small producers in Africa and so on, and big, like uh, currency backed by oil and mooring rights and so on. Trade coins are not exactly unknown, so they were known all along, along the, um, you know, the, uh, Chinese, the, the, the old Silk Road, and as well as in later on, in the form of Spanish pieces of eight and uh, Maria Teresa Tallers, right? So, and uh, then, you know, they have a lot of advantages, but unfortunately, time is running short, and I wanted to 
spend a little time on uh, Libra, you know, which was introduced by Facebook. Uh, you know, my take on it is uh, that uh, I, I can only follow what uh, Samuel Johnson said. Your manuscript is both good and original, but the part which is good is not original, and the part which is original is not good. And indeed, you know, if you look at what uh, Libra white paper says, it is pretty much what uh, Sandy Pentland and Thomas Harjun and I have written. Um, that's that's a good part. The part which is not so good is that it doesn't use um, you know, immunization, and then it violates the third postulate of Copernicus, and hence, if one were to introduce such Libra in the developing world, that would actually not be a good thing because it would increase inflation manifold, right? And so there is no time for me to go through this. I only want to cover, uh, you know, this a little bit uh, of centralized finance applications. So, as I said, Ethereum, warts and all, can be viewed as a consensus as a service provider, right? And as such, it can be used as a foundation for decentralized finance. In fact, I think that either Ethereum has to change and switch to a proof of stake concept, or it will migrate to other uh, chains where consensus is cheaper, but you know, for the time being, it's Ethereum. And so you can think about decentralized autonomous organizations, decentralized exchanges, payments and stable coin, yield farming, which is all the rage now, but it will not end well. Tokenization, which is very important because it can uh, tokenize real asset and create uh, something really interesting. And then gaming, identity provisions, things like that. So I will literally spend uh, two more minutes on the automated market makers, and then I will draw my conclusion. So automated market makers such as Uniswap, Bouncer, and Curve became immensely popular. So there's up to 15 billion US dollars uh, kind of uh, sucked into this universe. And the original idea is very simple, right? If you, and you can make it more complicated, but I mean, it's sort of not really essential. So suppose that you want to be a market maker in two tokens. So for example, two stable coins or more audaciously a stable coin and Ethereum, right? And so initially they priced on par. And of course, Ethereum worth $400 and the uh, stable coin worth $1 in principle. So, you know, think about it as a blocks of, you know, like 400 stable coins, that's sort of, you know, 300 stable coins, right? So a participant who wants to be a market maker has to put in the pool equal number um, of uh, tokens, right? So N1 equals N2 equals N. And it's put in the smart contract, as I said, which will be executed automatically. And at any moment in time, the rule of market making is super easy. N1 times N2 is equal to N squared. And so every time an arbitrager charges the, changes the composition of the pool, a percentage is paid to the pool operator, so half a percent, something like that. So assume that the, the price of the second token expressing the price of the first one uh, sort of deviates from the initial value of P equals one. So for example, it went up. Then an arbitrager will step in and, and in and purchase the second token by paying for it in, with the first. And then it is easy to calculate the optimal positions. The optimal position would be N1 is equal to square root of P times N, and N2 would be one over square root of P times N. And the arbitrageurs profit from doing it, aside from you know, uh, paying a transaction cost, would be square root of P minus one squared times N. And then of course the buy and hold portfolio would be N plus one times N. And so arbitrage portfolio value at the same time is two times square root of P times N. So percentage loss, which is called quite disingenuously in this uh, parlance as impermanent loss is uh, square root of uh, P minus one squared divided by P plus one. And the idea is that if price has been reverting, then the impermanent loss will go away as the name suggests, and transaction fees will accumulate to provide maybe 10% return. But of course, if the price does not mean revert, then kind of things will be lost. And so this is a curve which shows the percentage loss when price deviates from its equilibrium value of one. And you know, uh, the, 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 the jury is still out to what extent the whole thing is profitable. 
And let me draw my conclusions, and I apologize for overrunning by five minutes. So the idea of distributed ledgers is not new, and modern technology gives them new lease of life, and they can have numerous applications, and of course, digital cash is a promising venue. And if this were to happen, then retail banks can potentially bifurcate into narrow banks and investment pools, and asset-backed cryptocurrency can be a much needed counterpart to fiat currencies, and decentralized finance is whilst in its early stages, but if it develops further, it can provide a viable competitor to existing centralized framework. And at this stage, I want to thank various people who helped me thinking about it, like my wife and uh, partner in um, Numera Financial, Marshall Lipton, uh, Sandy Pentland, and Thomas Harjona from MIT, and my co-author for the book, Adrian Tricani. And um, that's about it. Thank you. Hey, wonderful. Thanks, uh, Alex, for a very interesting and uh, broad view of, of the De DeFi world and stable coins. We do have, I do have, I've received one question typed in. I encourage you to please type in your questions or uh, raise your hand or something to indicate that you'd like to ask them. Uh, Matsela, would you like to ask your question? You could unmute yourself and turn on your video. Matsela, are you there? Okay, how about I will read. Oh, okay, I see he's coming on. <coughs> you're, you're on mute right now. Can you hear me, Professor? Hello? Yes, I can hear you now. Go ahead, Matsela. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for a very detailed presentation. I think uh, my, I have a very simple question. Um, uh, in your opinion, would you think um, the, the current technologies moving from central bank digital currencies, asset backed currencies, um, smart contracts, do you think um, they will lead to more inclusivity, specifically towards the emerging markets, which may have certain particular market niches in terms of their, their application? I it's think. an excellent question and the simple answer is yes. The hope is that they should increase uh, inclusivity and, and uh, help uh, those developing countries where uh, say currencies are unstable and things like that. But how exactly to do this, it's not so easy because there are forces uh, making this decentralized, uh, originally decentralized project, highly centralized in the end. And I have already shown, you know, that there is a level of centralization, for example, for Bitcoin and Ethereum at the level of mining, but even more so it's at the level of exchanges. So for example, if you want to get the Bitcoin, you have to actually become a member of an, a customer of an exchange, which sort of defies the purpose of sort of being able to do this, um, you know, in a decentralized fashion. But the hope is, and that's what, for example, my colleagues at MIT and I have been aiming at is to indeed uh, make the situation more inclusive, create a stable uh, medium of exchange for those countries uh, who are struggling with having this thing, because the hope is that when the exchange is stable, the commerce will flourish and life will be actually easier for people and that sort of thing, right? But um, whether or not it will be done through the uh, blockchain technology or maybe through something very different. Um, that is, uh, the jury is out. I mean, I myself am of two minds. I don't think that you really can afford uh, the entire machinery of a distributed ledger, for example, to issue central bank cash. And it is quite possible that uh, it will be done differently by resuscitating and uh, building at a new level the old ideas of David Chaum of sort of um, blind signature mechanisms and things like that. So that is something which again, you know, my colleagues and I uh, have been working actively and hopefully within the next uh, few months we will be able to publish something to this effect. But a short, uh, this was a long answer. A short answer is yes. The hope is that it will be a tool for inclusivity. The details and practicalities remain to be seen. Hmm? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We have a uh, question, Matt. Would you like to, to ask it? Yeah. Um, so, Alex, you mentioned uh, that you think this whole yield farming uh, craze that is going on right now will end rather poorly. Um, so, as one who is doing a fair bit of this myself, uh, I'm wondering do you think that all forms of yield farming um, 
are going to sort of end poorly and are contributing to sort of destabilizing the system? Or do you think there are some forms of yield farming that are uh, advantageous? So, I mean, one of the simplest forms is being a liquidity provider. Uh, right. Another one are some of these sort of Ponzi-like coin issues. Well, look, I mean, Ponzi-like, are... you know the answer yourself. But yeah, by yeah. the way, Matthew, I, I owe you this, um, you know, interview. Can you resend me an email? I will, I will sure. send you this stuff. I, yeah, I forgot yeah. to do this. I apologize. Uh, but let me, let me actually ask one, one yeah. additional. It's part of this whole yield farming thing. But I would like to hear your opinion in particular on the value of these governance tokens that uh, seem to be highly valued. Yeah, well, look, my take on it is that there is only so much yield in the world. And whenever you hear that, you know, rather than having a parabola, you can draw another curve for the liquidity provision and uh, that will give you 300% a year. And so, well, whenever you hear that something will give you 300% a year, right? So under regular conditions, you know, you should be very, very cautious and sort of, you know, uh, I would say that providing liquidity might indeed, um, you know, might indeed be a viable proposition. And as I was explaining, even though I didn't have uh, time to go through detailed analysis through, for example, um, you know, kind of calculating the actual return by using the ornstein ullen back at the underlying process, which I actually did, but I, I'll put it in the book. Um, it was just not enough time to do this. Uh, that is something to, to, to sort of to look at. As long as uh, this is really uh, the underlying process has been reverting, you can have the same as you can have pairs trading for a strict uh, mean reverting process or even process which kind of has a weekly changing parameters, but overall as mean reverting, you can have this. But this, the magnitude, um, you know, I, I would imagine, look, I would imagine that anything more than 10% interest in this day and age is probably a figment of people's imagination and uh, cannot be sustained. As far as government tokens are concerned, they're being kind of dumped on the system and so on as a sweetener, if I understand correctly, you know, at least some of those, uh, um, you know, protocols. And, uh, you know, again, I, I, I'm, I'm, let me put it this way, for early adopters, perhaps, like with any Ponce scheme, you know, for those people who enter into it early on, all right, so this is probably a money-making proposition. The art of the situation is to get out of it on time, right? So because if you don't, then clearly you will lose your shirt. So all in all, I would say there is some value to be made, you know, in this environment, but it is relatively small and there is additional aspect which needs to be uh, pers people, uh, by the way, I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, approving any of those, uh, endorsing or anything, you know, whoever wants to do whatever they want to do, it's up to them. I myself am not doing it. But the point which I want to make is that even if there is a return, it would be a return in the in, intrinsic return, the same way as Bitcoin and Ethereum, a self-consistent system where uh, kind of the ledger is maintained intrinsically, right, and cannot be altered. But the value of Bitcoin or Ethereum vis-a-vis -vis outside um, quantities like dollars cannot be maintained within the system. The same way is there, right? So as long as you, for example, provide liquidity for automated market maker, right? You can grow the value of your tokens. However, if the tokens overall lose value vis-a-vis -vis the US dollar, your position in dollar terms can be completely wiped out. So internally, it will produce return. Whether it will produce return external, it's anybody's guess. Huh? Okay, there are a couple more questions, one from Jorg and one from Iris. Um, Maybe we can try to make them short since we're already at six. Uh, Jörg, would you like to go first? Yes, sure. Thank you. Thanks, Alex, for this outstanding presentation. Hello, uh, Jörg. How are you? Okay. Good. Good to see you after good after two years. You. So, yes. Yeah. For, well, two years. Um, do you mind giving some more details on your criticism, but also your, the positive aspects about Libra? 
you may it's, it's uh, yeah well look i mean my criticism is that uh, you know they really did not uh, read the carefully and did not uh, quote uh, things uh, which we have written but they should have done it but putting this aside overall my major problem with uh, sort of libra is that Libra is not being issued in an immunized form. So in other words, if you live in a developing country and want to acquire Libra, which by the, by, by the way, does not exist, and the jury is out whether or not it will exist in its kind of current form and so on, but putting this aside, assuming that it were to exist, then um, you would actually come with your pesetas or whatever um, currency is there, right? So, and you would have to buy the Libra. And so pesetas will be in the system because that will go to the seller of Libra and the Libra will be in the system. And so suddenly uh, there are two, um, you know, two instruments which both can be used for payments. So essentially, the number, the number of units of you know, account uh, increased by a factor of two, for example. And so clearly the prices have to react uh, very negatively. I mean, as I pointed out, you know, kind of um, Copernicus, you know, wrote about it in the 15th century, right? So he said that, uh, you know, you need to demonetize the existing um, currency prior to issuing the new one. So essentially, the way it should have worked, but it's not possible given that everything is digital. Um, so for example, you know, when they were uh, depreciating, you know, this uh, Polish lotties and issuing their own grossel and whatnot, so they would really take the old uh, coins, uh, remint them as the new ones, and then the old will disappear and the new one will appear. And that's why kind of the amount of silver in circulation will stay the same. Well, here, as I said, this is a very, very serious issue. And for example, you know, with Bitcoin, it's less of an issue. Be and then generally, you know, the overall capitalization of all the cryptocurrencies is relatively small, even though it's not infinitesimally small, but relatively small, like 400 uh, billion or 500 billion. So nothing to sneeze at, but not a lot. And then also they're being not really being in circulation and you cannot really pay for anything in Bitcoin, you know, regardless of what people say. And so there is no kind of, that, 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 that's the major thing. So it stays outside of the system, is not being used for payments and does not increase inflation. Whilst Libra is specifically designed as a payment mechanism. Yeah, all right. That was a brief answer, but shoot me an email. We can talk about more. Very good, thank you. Yeah. Okay, uh, maybe we'll take our last question from uh, Iris. Iris, would you like to ask a question? Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah, how are you? Yeah, I'm great. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. So I have a question about the um, IPO and STO, the security token um, offering. Um, do you think like I STO have a brighter future compared with the IPO? Because I did a, a project on it uh, to compare the uh, fee. You, you talk about ICO or IPO? IPO. IPO, like the conventional initial public offering, right? So, yeah, okay. yeah, exactly. Okay. And yeah, because nowadays um, the IPO is still like more more popular than STO, um, but we do know there are a lot of advantage of the STO, like you just mentioned in the presentation. You said like about the decentralized blockchain network or um, decrease the in intermediate um, like feeds, like those things. So um, my question is, what re what is the reasons causing it, or um, what solution would you suggest to improve STO? Like, what do you think of it? Uh, I think it's a positive initiative, and as I already mentioned, I think that uh, I do see a bright future in tokenization and generally sort of moving assets to to blockchain. And you know, in particular, like if I had more time to show, for example, some of the slides where I was talking about a decentralization of. Um, uh, decentralization of uh, um, clearance and settlement and so on and so forth sort of in the ideal third stage of sort of this process you know you could issue stocks directly into the blockchain and then sort of uh, that would be an uh, STO for you so yes I hope uh, I mean it's still in its infancy but that is clearly 
that is clearly something which will become important down the road. So some of the things which need to be taken into account is that uh, one needs to have a very solid legal framework for doing this. And that is something which is being worked in several jurisdictions, in Switzerland in particular, and even in the United States, there are some states like Wyoming where they are working on, you know, really building something like that. When and if it is done, yeah, then the future will be bright. Hmm? Okay, thank you. Thank you for your... All right, shoot me an email. I would like to see what you have done in this direction, all okay, right? Sure. Thank okay, sure. Okay, thank you. Okay, great. Wonderful. Thanks, uh, Alex, for a really intriguing talk. Lots to digest and chew. And uh, I'm sure, well, I'm certainly looking forward to the book. I'm sure that uh, a number of the participants here and others are going to going to uh, pick it up pretty quickly once it's out. Uh, and I guess with that, I'll thank the audience for being here. It's been... Uh, uh, very uh, fantastic talk, and we're looking forward to the next seminar, which will be on October. Thank you very much, everybody. Sebastian and uh, Thomas, uh, Mateos, thank you very much, Dan, uh, for organizing this wonderful opportunity. It's really invigorating. Thank you very much. Mateos, shoot me an email, all right? Bye-bye. Thanks, Alex. Great seeing you, everyone. Really appreciate it.